Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. We're recording a remote episode, one of these quick hitters. And usually Bernie goes solo with these, but once in a while I'm happy to jump in and, and, and break things down with my esteemed colleague, Scott Bernstein, in the house. Hey now. So I uh, just want to remind everyone, please, if you like the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our audio podcast. We're on Spotify. Uh, we're on iTunes, Google Podcast, and just make it. I've made this appeal before, but if you're familiar, if you like our our video content, just recall that we have other audio episodes you can check out. And if you primarily listen to us on audio, remember we also have some video exclusives. So I encourage audience members to to, to be open minded and, and check out both formats. Uh, we have a pretty cool topic for today uh, involving some heavy hitters. Uh, some bosses on, in the uh, five families, uh, Messino, and also the boss of the West Side. And uh, Scott has been doing some data mining and was looking at some court filings and, and found some interesting tidbits in there uh, that we're going to talk about for a few minutes. So, Scott, you want to want to set up what, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what you were finding? Yeah, so this involves uh, Joe Messino, uh, Vinny Gorgeous, Basciano, and Barney Belomo. Um I don't know up until recently if we've been able to draw any connections or lines between Joe Messino, who was the most powerful, biggest New York mafia don of the 90s and early 2000s, to Barney Belomo, who in 2023 is, I don't want to say without question, but for for, for most people's... Um, you know, bottom line, I would say that Barney Belomo is the most powerful uh, modern day uh, mafia don in America and New York. Um, and let's start with some information that came out last week via Gangland News. And, uh, and uh, uh, we always uh, give props and shout out to to Jerry Capaci over at uh, Gangland News. He he started this whole game that we play, so uh, <laughs> always got to give him give him his props. Uh, he wrote a column or part of his column was about Vinny Basciano, the former acting boss of the Bananos, who was underneath Joe Messino and uh, had a, a pretty tumultuous, short lived uh, tenure as, as boss of the family in uh, 04, 05. Uh, he's now doing a, a multiple life sentences for a pair of murders as well as some murder plots against prosecutors and judges. Uh, but there was an appeal that's now being heard by U.S. District Court. Uh, it's been a, a, a six-year waiting period to get in front of the judge. Now they're getting in front of the judge. And Bastiano is appealing his murder sentence, uh, murder uh, conviction in the Randy Pozzolo hit from 2004 under the um, theory that he was in trap because Joe Messino at that time had flipped, was working for the government, nobody knew it, was wired up, and Bastiano's counsel is saying that it was entrapment and that it was ineffective counsel for not bringing up this entrapment issue before, that when Messino was asking Bastiano to explain what happened in the Pozzolo hit. Bastiano had no other option but to respond uh, because he was being ordered to respond by his superior in the mafia. And if he didn't respond, he could be murdered. Um, within that reporting, Jerry made a reference to a piece of a court transcript that came up in, in Vinnie Bastiano's trial back in 07 with Messino on the witness stand. Again, this has been there in the transcript for, for, let's say, 15 years, but this little anecdote, I don't think it ever made it uh, to the light of day until last week. And Jerry says there was a conversation, or I should say, points out in the transcript that Messino testifies to a conversation that he had with the Genovese crime family, that they had come to him when he was locked up and asked him if they wanted them, the Genovese, to murder 
Vinny Bashiana. Um, and we'll get into why in a second. Jerry didn't put in there who the people uh, within the Genovese had approached Massino. So uh, myself, I saw some people online did it as well, uh, went back into the court transcript from Massino's testimony. And it's clear from this testimony that it was Barney Belomo who approached him in around 2005 in the, in the Metropolitan Detention Center. Uh, and we're going to read the, the direct uh, quotes, but, you know, for all intents and purposes and to break it down into a, a small bite-sized uh, uh, situation, he, he says, you know, your boy Vinny is acting crazy out on the streets. He's walking around the Bronx like he's John Gotti. And that's upsetting a lot of people. Uh, Massino says, no, don't touch him. But it's interesting to see that you have this meeting of a, a, a Don that was on his way out and a Don that was ascending, you know, into the stratosphere in, in Belomo. And they had this conversation back in 2005. Yeah, um, I want to read some some things from the transcript here. So at the beginning, and I just want to clarify because you've studied this documentation more than I have. At the beginning, he says, I could have killed him. They wanted me to kill him, but I gave him a pass. The West Side comes to me when I was on the floor. They said, you need help. We'll get rid of him. I said, let him go. Let him do what he's doing. So at, at, in that context, Messino's talking about Bastiano. He's saying, yeah. I'll give him a pass. Leave him alone. And then it says... Um, well, let's just tell people what the issue was. The yeah. issue was that Bastiano was acting autonomously um, and breaching a lot of protocol uh, first when it came to appointing himself acting boss. Massino never officially assigned him the role of acting boss. Bastiano assigned himself and then retroactively got permission from Massino. And then within that time period, which was about a eight month, nine month time period, Bastiano orders the murder of Randy Pozzolo, who was a former member of his inner circle. I think he drove uh, drove for Bastiano for a while and was a real cowboy. Uh, it seemed like Vinny's ascension in the Bananos went to Randy Pozzolo's head. As Vinny got more powerful, Randy's behavior got more outlandish. He was proposed to be made, but uh, never made it to a making ceremony because of upsetting too many people. He upset the Gambinos, he upset the Genovese, and eventually he upset Vinny himself uh, by botching a home remodel job. Uh, and he was killed in November of 04, about a, two weeks after Vinny Bastiano is arrested. Um, fast forward into 05, I believe is when these conversations or this conversation was being had by uh, Belomo to Messino in lockup being like, Vinny is um, being insubordinate, I guess, in, in some of his actions and that we'll kill him for you. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would also add from this documentation so when they so they ask him who, who were you talking with specifically and as you point out he says he says barney and this is a quote listen the word is in the street nobody's happy with Vinny basciano the way he's acting and then this is from Messino. quote barney comes to me and says quote He's causing a lot of waves in the Bronx. He thinks he's John Gotti. And then he says, if you need help, again, makes this offer. Like, we can we can, we can, can take care of this, according to Messino. And in, in terms of your point about um, causing a lot of waves and walking around the, the Bronx, and this is from also from, I'm getting this right from our friend Tony DiStefano's book on Vinnie Gorgeous. Who he's been on our show before, not on video, I don't think, but we have an audio mm -hmm. episode with him. That Messino claims 
that Bastiano wanted permission to kill a, a number of people, including Di Filippo, a high-ranking okay. member of the including Bronx. Patty from the Bronx, who was his capo, but also the parents of witnesses uh, in this trial, um, and uh, the prosecutor, civilians, civilians, and, and the prosecutor. Right, and that the was the that was the biggest the biggest yeah. one that ended up getting him uh, getting him jammed up. So um, apparently this wasn't sitting well with all these different things, wasn't sitting well with, with people on the West side and they approached Messino. I, I think there should be a, um, just to fill in a little bit more background and I want to throw this out to Jimmy. Um, so you had a situation where in the lead up to Bastiano being imprisoned, less than a year I believe before this conversation happens between Belomo and Massino, there's an issue between Bastiano's son, Vinny Jr., and Quiet Dom Cirillo's son, Nikki. And Quiet Dom Cirillo uh, was an acting boss, was a conciliary of the Genovese, very close to the chin. Um, and apparently, in late April or early May of 04, Nikki Cirillo physically attacks Vinny Basciano Jr. Um, on May 10th, which was Mother's Day of that year, Nikki Cirillo disappeared and has never been heard from since. Randy Pozzolo, one of the final nails in his coffin, was Pozzolo was going around town bragging that he had killed Cirillo to defend the Bastiano's honor. So, but there's a lot of confusion of what happened there because when Bastiano is asked about Nikki Cirillo from Messino in these recorded conversations, Bastiano says it came from his own dad. Right. Bastiano right. says that was Dom killing his own son. Now, I don't know if that's true. Bastiano was just was ordering a lot of murders and taking part in a bunch of murders that he wasn't getting sanctioned. Yeah. Now, the Frank Santoro murder, which he he had, even if he gets the Pozzolo murder tossed or, or, or acquitted on it in a retrial, if it ever gets to that point, he still has to deal with the Frank Santoro murder uh, back in 01, where he killed a guy that had been threatening his son, Vinny Jr. That was a, a murder that was done without any permission and he was just a soldier at that point he wasn't a capo yet and then Pizzolo murder he does without checking with Messino um, which is one of the reasons Messino was talking to, or ostensibly one of the reasons Messino wanted to talk to him about it um, when 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 he, they were locked up and I think the, the, the famous line that came from that was that uh, you know we needed to send a message Randy was acting um, subversive uh, and we needed to send a, a message to the street. This was Vinny trying to like establish his his aura as a boss, and that you know, even my even guys in my inner circle are going to be killed if they don't toe the line. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's the one guy that there seems to have been a consensus on like killing like yeah. <laughs> the Zolo. But um, back to um, Cirillo, uh, for what it's worth. I, I hate to even say this. I've heard. I know it sounds like obnoxious, but talking to people off the record, people on the street find that difficult to believe that he had something to do with the disappearance of his own son. That's so for what that's right. right, and so right. that um, and and so that if you analyze that, take it for what it's worth. But uh, I can't really say more. But I just think it just. I just. I think it gives some context and some color to 2005 Barney sidling up to Messino and being like, listen, you know, you need to be aware that your boy is ruffling a lot of feathers, meaning Vinny Basciano, that he, whether or not he eventually got it cleared that he had appointed himself boss. We know from the Gotti situation with Castellano I, the West Side doesn't take kindly to people just doing stuff without permission 
or without the proper sanctioning. No, they're very buttoned up. They're very buttoned up organization. Yeah. That's that's one of the reasons why they're usually the the most powerful family. They're very probably, buttoned up, well organized. And the analogy to Gotti probably wasn't. What I'm saying was probably part of that analogy, with Bologna being like, we don't need another. Yeah. You know, a replay of someone like Agati who was doing all these things um, that that Rose. were uh, uh, making waves, causing heat, and and Bastiano seemed to love the heat, like Gotti loved the heat. Yeah, there, uh, there's a, there's a there's an irony here. This is just my own conjecture. So again, take it for what it's worth. The the irony is, I suspect right now the West Side may prefer Bastiano back in the, in the driver's seat yeah. compared to what what's going on right now with the Bonanos. Like, yeah. So and then, you know, things change, right? And Bastiano's tied into that same group that, or was tied in to that same group that that's leading uh, the Bonanno organization now, the Bronx crew, the powers in the Bronx now with Mikey Mancuso um, and, and Johnny Joe. These were guys that were at one point Vinny's guys he put Mancuso into power when he left and went to prison and eventually had a falling out with Mancuso, tried to kill me or try to put a contract out on Mancuso's head, was trying to put a contract out on, on Patty the, from the Bronx's head. These are all guys that were in his camp. Mm-hmm. That's Yeah. So it's not shocking that, that Belomo would approach Massino. It's just interesting to find that out now, almost 20 years later. And uh, it's interesting that Jerry, either didn't want to go dive into the uh, transcript or he didn't want to put Barney on blast, but he had a whole paragraph about the Genovese approaching Messino, but didn't say that it came from Barney. It seems like that would be, you know, the meat and potatoes of that news, at least in, I guess, the way I would cover it. And by the way, just if, if people, if you, if you never look at the document, they they actually they actually don't say Belomo, but I, yeah, say Scott and I are almost certain that it's a it's a spelling error on the part of the stenographer. Um, well, they say Borello, I think, right? They say Barney Borello, who was Barney Borello, yeah. which is it's it's unimaginable to me that Messino wouldn't know who wouldn't know who Barney was. So I I would bet anything that that was a, just an error on the part of the stenographer. Um, but let me ask you your your put on your uh, law degree hat, Scott, before we wrap up. Um, in my opinion, this is a very legitimate case Bastiano is making about entrapment. I, I, I absolutely think he's onto something here. I think that was dirty pool, to use a cliche, that the feds did with Messino wiring Messino up and then him giving Bastiano orders, basically, that Bastiano has no no choice. but to, and, then, and then you're going to indict Bastiano for following orders. That seems dirty pool to me. Um, so I would ask you two questions. A, what what do you think? Do you think do you agree with me on that? But then also, let's say he wins that. Doesn't he have so many other charges that it's not like he he would be released anytime yeah. soon, even if he were were to win that appeal? Right. What do you think about those two points? So, so first, I, I I agree with you. I think they're at least at least in terms of the eye test and the fact that I have a um, a law degree. Hit the siren, Benny. Um, uh, there seems to be some legal merit to that. Uh, and the fact that the judge is, is going to consider it now, um, I think speaks to that. To your other point, he's got the Frank Santoro murder, which he was convicted of. He's got these murder conspiracies, attempted murder conspiracies that he was convicted of. But so, so yes, if, even if he gets a new trial, with the with the uh, the wire uh, of him talking to Messino tossed, Messino can't testify to that that conversation. And let's say in a in a perfect world for for Vinnie Gorgeous, he's acquitted of the Pozzolo murder. I think his theory. I mean, there, there'd be a lot of red tape to have to cut through to eventually see freedom. But at that point, there's a potential light because you can, as crazy as it sounds, with deals and time serves and stuff you know michael mancuso who we're talking about mikey knows he caught to the randy pozzolo murder yeah he did 12 years for the pozzolo murder um but it didn't send him away for the rest of his life so i'm thinking to myself if he can get the pozzolo murder 
tossed, he could somehow go to a, get a reset or, or attempt to get a resentencing from the judge on the Santoro uh, murder and possibly get an outdate where he's done 30 years um, and, and, and there's an opportunity for him to hit a halfway house. And then uh, he's only 63. I think he's probably in his mind thinking if by my early seventies, I can, I can get out, I can live my last 15 years yeah. uh, free. Who knows? There's been, there's crazier things have happened. I mean, yeah. I always, in the mob, I always point to Joe Legambi in Philadelphia. I mean, there should have never been a Joe Legambi, uh, uh, mafia godfather era you know he was he was dead to rights in prison doing doing a, a life sentence and then uh case gets uh tossed and and he's out on the streets and he becomes boss so yeah the stars uh, aligned right so yeah the, uh, the especially the uh, assassination conspiracy with the prosecutors the one that i always think he's going to have the hardest time with because the feds especially do not take that lightly that that alone they would try to try to get you a life sentence yep. and that's why he was in uh supermax for a while i don't know yeah. if he's still in supermax i, I don't think so. out. i think he's out by now out of the supermax but uh and last thing i'll say and we've said it before here i mean nothing seems to phase vinnie gorgeous i mean john Gotti at the you, you watch the uh, those those tape recording those surveillance videos of him in prison uh between 90 92 and 02 when he died he seemed just really pissed off and he's angry. unrecognizable toward the end right. he was you wouldn't even know it was john Gotti. Right. all look the like pictures him. that are filtering yeah. out of Vinny, he's smiling ear to ear his hair is hey, looks like a million bucks. bucks he's got a, he's got his tan <laughs> yeah. he's, he's sitting posing with i mentioned it on a, on a quick hitter that we just did uh, about the appeal that he one of the video or one of the pictures that recently came out on, on social media is him with a bunch of Mexican mafia guys yeah. um, with like five or six Mexican mafia guys. So he doesn't, he seems like he can go with the flow uh, and, and doesn't, he seems to be doing the time instead of the time doing him. Yeah. Yeah. He seems, yeah, he still, he still looks like, um, you know, pr pretty healthy guy. So we'll see what happens. Well, thanks for uh, joining me, Jimmy. Um, another one of these quick hitters in the books. We'll keep you updated on what's going on with Vinny's appeal. Um, check out Gangster Report with some you know, deep dives into to Vinny's case. I did a deep dive into the Pozzolo hit. I also uh, did a, a story about um, how Dom Chicali, who was Vinny's right-hand man, and along with Messino, the star witness at Vinny's trial, how Chicali met Bonanno, and he was actually introduced by one of the characters in Goodfellas. Or I say one of the actors in Goodfellas who played one of the characters in the famous bamboo lounge scene when he's introducing all the members of the Vario crew, uh, Pete the Killer, who says, I took care of that thing for you. That's uh, his uncle, right? Isn't that Chicago? Pete the, you know, Pete the Killer was a real Lucchese mob guy. His uncle was a guy named Pete the Neck, Chicali, who played Pete oh. the Killer in Goodfellas. And uh, Pete the Neck was the one who introduced. Um, Chicali to uh, Vinny Gorgeous at a Christmas 1999 uh, lunch meeting in Manhattan uh, with Bruno and Delicato, who was his entry point in, into Vinny. So check that out. I'm going to do something else on the uh, Patty from Patty from the Bronx murder conspiracy that will be out in the next couple of days that I got from the court filings. And, and then obviously what's going on, on the West side, we're always uh, keeping tabs on that because they are, uh, they're 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 the front page mob family. They're they're the mob family that everybody wants to know about because they're doing things at a level that nobody else does it does it at. They're they're elite. So, yeah, the I, I think you said how he met Bonanno, but you meant Bastiano. Yeah, sorry, Bastiano. Yeah. How, right? How I apologize. How Chicali met Bastiano. Eventually, became Bastiano's best friend, right hand man, um, but didn't know him until the late 1999 uh, intro through his uncle Pete the Neck. Who played Pete the Killer in Goodfellas? Yeah, a lot of it's in. Uh, again, shout out to our friend Tony DiStefano. A lot of that is um, not only check out Gangster Report, but um, yeah, in that book, Tony's book is good. Great too. book, great book. All right, well, thanks, Jimmy, for Ben behind the glass. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod out. Mm -hmm.